welcome to the First United Methodist Church online worship service. Today's service is performed by Pastor Aaron Ackney. Now here is today's service. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Just have a few announcements this morning. The biggest one I have is this is the last week. And you all know what I'm talking about. Our pumpkin patch ends on Monday, and we have lots of spaces that we need filled to be greeters and helpers. We have no one signed up for today. And we've got Tuesday, and we've got a, one every other day for that. So if you can sign up on that board back there and let us know that you can help us, we would greatly appreciate it. We had a wonderful weekend. We had an awesome fall festival. Lots of people there, and it was a lot of fun, and we appreciate everyone helping with that. But we've got to finish strong. So if you can sign up on that board or call Lee in the office and let her know when you can help, we would greatly appreciate that. Also, don't forget, Tuesday is our meeting um, for our um, church council. Thank you. Keep getting the name of it. Um, we have that for those people. And we also have an announcement from Bob Sanders. Good morning. Good morning. Um, on October 13th, Pastor Aaron and I flew out to Salt Lake City. And we had a two-day training um, session with uh, a organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. Um, we were there on the 14th and 15th for the actual training. Um, the purpose of Sleep in Heavenly Peace is to basically build, build beds. Their motto is, no kid sleeps on the floor in our town. And they basically build beds for free through donation, community support, and they provide them to uh, to kids. Okay. Um, it was started uh, back actually in 2012. There was a gentleman by the name of Luke Mickelson who built 11 beds for a church youth group, um, donated to a needy family. Just after that, he built a bed with his family, put it on Facebook, and offered it as a free bed for whoever might need it. Well, the reaction from the community was amazing. He said that they got offers of free bedding, uh, money, etc. So that's kind of how Sleep in Heavenly Peace got started. Um, the, the, the way it works basically is it's a nonprofit organization. Um, the administrative support that we met with when we were out in Salt Lake City was amazing. Uh, they've already, I mean, we're just starting, but they've already basically contributed about $2,000 to our chapter here. Uh, they flew us out uh, to Salt Lake City, put us up in a hotel, fed us, uh, and gave us all the, all the training aspects with uh, finance and grants and insurance and just you name it, they, they, they had a speaker for it. Um, it, was, uh, it was pretty involved, it was a lot of, your brain was full by the time we got out of there. Um, but it's basically a, a chapter community-based organization. Um, we intend on contacting um, a lot of air, uh, organizations around town, um, uh, different uh, stores, uh, Walmart, uh, uh, you know, other other stores around the area. Um, I'd like to we'd like to speak to some of the members of the of the town. Um, chapters to see if we can get some assistance. Um, there is a, a large co-sponsorship that they have, that the organization has with Lowe's. Uh, we just received a $4,000 grant uh, from Lowe's for us to be able to buy tools, things like that. It's kind of a, a, a pay forward sort of a thing, so we do have to pay that back in a year, but after we built a certain number of beds, uh, we'll be getting grants up to $8,000 a year. 
and this is all from support from those. I believe Walmart has some uh, some giving programs as, as well for uh, for bedding and things like that. Um, Stephen Henley Peace has given us a Facebook page and a web page uh, for our chapter uh, that will be able to maintain, update, and uh, get the word out as far as what our operation is going to be. Um, as far as their, their history, um, it's pretty amazing. This year alone, uh, nationwide, they've built 34,244 beds. They have, they've had 53,000 volunteers. Um, they've delivered actually 27,876 beds, and they've formed 46 new chapters. Uh, since its inception, which from what we've seen with some of the uh, chapters, was probably in the 2018 time frame of when they actually uh, were an organization, uh, they've built 134,000 beds. They've had over 266,000 volunteers and they've delivered 104,680 beds with 326 chapters. I think they're in 48 states. Uh, so it's, it's a large nationwide organization, including Hawaii and Alaska. So they're pretty broad. Um, the training aspect of what we went through was in a couple of areas. Uh, the picture here is actual training, a, 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 a conference room that we had in one of the town hall rooms, um, you can see the, uh, the number of people. We had about 60 people that were there from pretty much all over the country. Uh, and like I said, we went through a lot of different aspects of, of the administrative side of, of Sleep and Heavenly Peace. And then we also took part in, uh, in a bed belt simulation where they set up uh, workstations for us and we were able to touch the process in each station as to how the beds are done. They use a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of forms that they use to be able to make sure that it's built the proper way. Um, but it was interesting. They, uh, they, let, us, uh, they let us go through and, and actually get our hands on the on different stations to do that. Um, finally, we had an opportunity to make a bed delivery. That was uh, impressive. Um, we went to a family uh, there in Salt Lake, Salt Lake City who, there were two kids, I believe, in the house. Uh, they didn't have beds. Um, I was talking with the mother and she just lost her job previous week. So there's a lot of needy people. And uh, this is our picture of after we assembled the bed and you see the group of, of us that uh, took part and put it together. So I gotta say it was, a, it was an impressive few days uh, uh, we met a lot of great people, um, and we've got a lot of a lot of good plans ahead, and we'll keep you all posted as to what's going on. So, thank you.
shall we begin in this place today? We are the people of God. We are disciples of Christ. We are the home of God's Spirit. How does this understanding of who we are affect us? Only God can make us whole. We worship God today and celebrate our
thank you. First of all, thank you to Dorothy for helping us last week when we were gone. And since we were gone last week, we didn't have the opportunity to thank you for the nice appreciation card and gift that you gave to Peggy and myself um, this month. It means a lot to us to be loved and accepted here. And uh, we feel very much at home here. So we thank you for that. I want to take a moment for an, uh, two announcements. Number one, um, some of you might remember Cheryl Hammonds. She's been with us now for, oh, I'm going to guess, 10 months to a year. Sometimes we don't know people by name, we know people by where they sit. <laughs> and normally she sits right back there where Brad and Lori are sitting this morning, right, right about in that spot. Cheryl has had a massive stroke and she's paralyzed on her right side. She lives alone and she really has no family. So her life has been changed dramatically. And we would ask that uh, you would lift her and the situation to God, asking for God's goodness and mercy in her life. Lord, as we come to this moment now in our worship today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us and our lives would be changed. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So we are starting a new sermon series today, a new worship series that revolves around what I would suggest is probably one of the most important questions in human life. This will lead us right up to the Sunday of Advent. Now to be sure, there are many important questions in life. But some questions stand out above other questions. I think this is one of those questions. Each one of us must answer this question for ourselves. How our lives unfold before us is a direct result of our answer to this question. The question has deep biblical and theological roots. And so with that introduction, here's the question. Who am I? Being confident and assured of that answer of who I am is what gives direction in our lives. We might remember that Jesus made numerous statements about who he was. And at one point he asked this important question to the apostles. Who do you say that I am? Now for those of us who believe that maybe the most important question for us to answer is who we believe God is, and I would say, that's correct. That is the most important question. Here is the connection. Knowing who God is directly impacts me knowing who I am. So these are connected for sure. Jesus said it this way, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. So knowing who God is and who we are is exactly what brings fulfillment to us 
in life. And that ties into our mission as the church of God. We are to be and then to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we need to be specific. That's disciples of Jesus Christ. We, you can be a disciple of lots of things. But when we know who God is and who we are, we must become disciples of Jesus Christ. And until we establish and affirm and live our lives as disciples of Christ, we will always be in turmoil inside. We will never have peace. We were created by God. So until we find ourselves in tune with our Father God, we will be out of tune with the rest of the world and life. So this sermon series is about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have each been asked numerous times in our lifetime to introduce ourselves, to say something about ourselves, sometimes briefly and sometimes depending upon the circumstances in some kind of detail. So I want you to think about those episodes, those, those, those times in your life and how you responded. How do we respond when someone says, well, tell me, tell me something about yourself. I know for me, too often, I have talked about my family, about my job, about my hobby, about my interests, about my accomplishments, where I grew up, where I got educated, on and on and on. None of which really speak to the most important issue about who I am. Why do we do that? What is that all about? So the question is, how would you, how would I, how would we describe what life is like as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Some years ago, I came across a profession of faith that was written by a young South African man. Quite honestly, I'm, I'm not even positive which one of the countries in South Africa he is from because I personally have kind of lost track with all of the political changes in the area. I've, I've kind of lost track. I would be hard pressed to even name all of the countries that are in Africa, especially South Africa right now. This young man was presented the gospel, however, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he received the Holy Spirit in his heart. It changed his entire life. The price that he paid for that was costly. His native tribe no longer welcomed him. He was outcast. And even his own family, his blood family, gave him an ultimatum to choose either Christ or them. This profession of faith was written in response to them. We are going to review it these next weeks in worship as we examine this concept about us being disciples of Jesus Christ. It's entitled, I Am a Disciple. So I want us to read the first part of this together. I have it on the screen. Hopefully we'll I'll be able to kind of read this out loud, and by the time we're finished with this sermon series, we will have the whole thing, and, and at that point, I'll give us a copy, each of us a copy of this. It says, let's read, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. 
I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast, and I have stepped over the line. The love of God controls me. The decision has been made. I will not look back. I will not let up. I will not slow down. I will not back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. So let's look at this for just a minute. It says, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. Paul used that word several times in his letters. The idea about being unashamed. Remember what he wrote to the Romans? He said, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. And then in the end of the book of Romans, he says, they were convicted by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Within the social climate, the media, the academic, and the scientific arenas that are present in our culture today, it's easy to be intimidated as a Christian. So, we have a tendency to use discretion for those who might know we are really Christians. And maybe even we use more discretion about who would not know that we are really Christians. Let's be honest as we think about that. Persecution of the Christian faith is becoming more and more part of our lives in this country. It's a reality. Are we in danger of any real physical threat at this point? No. Not yet, but certainly in the terms of social acceptance and attitude, we are set apart. We're persecuted. So this is no small declaration that this, this young man makes. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. It is one thing to believe in God. It is another thing to not be intimidated into shame for believing in God. Martin Luther spoke about the church within the church. Let me just say this right now. If you are truly unashamed of the gospel, about this good news, if you are here right now and are truly unashamed, stand up. This, this is the fellowship of the unashamed that he's talking about. And when one sees such a fellowship, you are more likely to become a part of that fellowship. And as God sends us out into the world this week, I hope some will see and will join. Thank you. You see. Next he says, I have Holy Spirit power. This is the advantage that we have in this age because we live in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been dispersed. The Holy Spirit is in each one of our hearts. When we're here collected today, the power of the Holy Spirit is magnified because each one of us has brought the Holy Spirit with us. As disciples of Christ, we have potential we have never even dreamed of through the Holy Spirit of the Almighty God within us, dwelling within us. 
I can do all things through Christ. It is never an issue of whether we are able to do God's work. It's only an issue of whether we will do God's work. Our own hearts and our own minds are what box us in and limit us. Because we have unlimited power in science with Christ in our hearts. It says the die has been cast. When I was working in a foundry right out of high school trying to earn money for college, I learned what this is all about. A die is a mold or an impression. Anything poured or pressed into, cast into that die will come out in only one way. It'll come out in the exact same shape as the die. And that's what God is seeking in our lives. Right? It's God's desire that each one of us would be the exact character of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. So the die has been cast. I have stepped over the line, he says. A decision has to be made about God. Each of us has to make that decision. We must choose who we are, who we believe God is. There are several stories in the Bible where people, God's people, a representative for God, literally drew a line and the ground for people to step over, sort of like standing up today. God does not appreciate straddling the fence or standing on the line or being lukewarm. Those things are no good. You are either for me or against me, Jesus said. You cannot serve two masters, God and and the love of God controls me, he writes. Which makes sense, sense because the Spirit of God dwells in me. God is love. Who is God? God is love. God is holy. What does the world need the most of today? Love and holiness. I mean, there's plenty of the profane and the unholy all around us, isn't there? We all know how ugly that is. The world needs to be beautiful. What brings beauty, love, and holiness? To set that off, we must spread through the control of Christ in our hearts. We must spread the love of God so that all of our thoughts and all of our words and all of our actions would be loving and holy. And the world would be able to see just how loving and holy God, our Father, is. Because we've been cast in the die. The decision has been made, he says. I remember 1976 really well. I remember one evening in February of that year, having visitors come to my house and asking me the question, would you like to make a decision tonight to follow Jesus Christ and have a prayer of confession? Um, no, not, not, right, not right now, thank you very much. And so the people visiting us left. But thanks be to God that after they were gone and Peggy and I were meditating with each other through the Holy Spirit, the decision was made that night. And a prayer was spoken. And the debate was over. And the waffling ended. I made up my mind. I stepped over the line. 
And I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I have to tell you, 46 years later, I reaffirm that decision every day. This is the best decision I've ever made. I'm a disciple of His. His, meaning Jesus Christ. Who will we choose to study? Who will we choose to learn from? Who will we look up to? Who will be our mentor? Who will we trust with the truth? Who is worthy of us to emulate? That's exactly why God sent Jesus into the world. To be our teacher, to be our example, to lead us and to reconcile us with God so that we could be cast in the die and adopted as his children. I will not look back. Jesus said, whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. One of the most unhealthy things we do is to double guess ourselves. Looking back, oh, I don't know, maybe that's it. That's the stuff that leads to mental instability and insecurity. One of the first things you learn as a runner in track is to keep your eyes focused ahead of you. Never look back. Look toward the goal that you are traveling toward. Because if you look back, it will throw you off stride. Paul says to the Philippians, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus in my life. Now here's the truth. This is really good news, church. God has given us victory over our past. We do not need to look back. We spoke about this two weeks ago in worship. We only need to remember the lessons from the past. We don't need to revisit the past. And when we doubt, please, doubt Doubt your doubts. Never doubt your faith. I will not let up, he says. The writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that would slow us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Persevering, enduring, that is the huge message, especially in the New Testament, but throughout the whole scriptures. It's repeated over and over again, that encouragement. It's found throughout God's word to us. It's the key admonition. I believe it's the central focus of the book of Revelation. We can get all wrapped up in all of these numbers and symbols and signs and stuff in the book of Revelation. What's the book of Revelation basically saying? Don't ever give up on your faith. Keep on keeping on. It's never too late. Don't stop now. One more time. Don't ever let up. And he says, I will not slow down and I will not back away. There are multiple distractions in our lives. The way is broad and it appears really glamorous that leads to destruction. Many go that way. The way is narrow and sacrificial that leads to life. And few travel that road. 
Here is a life maxim. Seldom is easy worthwhile. Almost never is easy worthwhile. I like the image of a soul train. We each are riding a soul train. Believe this, the world is trying to impede our progress. The world is trying to derail our soul train. The Apostle Paul sends Timothy and us full speed ahead in our soul trains. He uses these words. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, and for this reason, I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have committed unto him. Full speed ahead. <coughs> my past is redeemed. Satan is constantly trying to mess up our present and our future. And he does that by trying to chain us to our past. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, however, is that our past has been redeemed by Jesus Christ. We're forgiven. The price for our past mistakes has been paid. There is nothing in the past that needs to destroy my present and my future with God. I've been reconciled. Jesus said, this cup is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. We use that every month when we come to this holy table. Here's a remedy suggestion. When the evil one tries to remind you of your past and derail you, remind him of his future. For just as surely as our past has been made clean, his future is sealed in the lake of fire. Amen. My present, therefore, makes sense. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That means without Jesus, we do not know the way or the truth or have life. We are not really alive with no understanding about who God is and who I am and God's reality, how can I possibly make sense of the present time? And my future is secure. Fear is one of our greatest adversaries to our well-being. It can totally disarm us and disable us. Consequently, the evil one is constantly trying to create fear in our lives. Fear is based on something that we perceive might happen. Therefore, the idea about fear of the unknown. For example, Fear of the future. What might happen in the future? And related to that is the idea about the fear of death. What happens when I die? Do you see how it is? What we do not know that really generates fear and scares us? The good news of the gospel takes away that fear. Faith and love override that fear. God has
guaranteed. The God who does not lie has guaranteed our future. We know what the future will be. Think about that. Jesus Christ has opened eternal life for all who believe in their hearts and confess with their lips that he is Lord. There's no question, there's no doubt, there's no maybes, there's no ifs, there's no what. It's absolute. Paul writes to the Corinthians, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when that happens, what is written will come true. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our future is. We do not have to live in fear. Our future is secure. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to gain more insight from this incredible profession of faith. In the meantime, dare to be a disciple in the world.
creator of everything there is, giver of life, the father of each human soul. We worship you and praise you. We glorify you. Thank you for this incredible world that you have given to us. The amazing variety and extremes and opposites, hot and cold and bright and dark, textures and colors. Lord, it's just astounding. And, and it's so humbling to know that you, you made that for us. So we would enjoy our time here in this world. Thank you. And even as you have done that for us, Lord, we know that you have promised that you will be with us always. So we rest on that promise today. Lord, we, we commit to being like you. That as your children, so we would carry not just the family name, but we would carry your image, our family image, into the world. Help each of us do that more boldly, Lord, unashamedly, on purpose. Lord, so it's, we can't even help ourselves but doing that. We even do it unconsciously. And Lord, we turn to you right now with these concerns, these prayer requests. We would name names even right now, out loud, before your throne of grace. As the sound of these names rises to your ears, Lord, we just, we celebrate the fact that in our faith, we believe that you, you are answering every one of these prayers in the lives of these people, even right now. Lord, prayers, our prayers, do make a difference. We can't explain it. We can't understand it fully. It goes beyond our human minds. But Lord, we know it's true. Father, we continue to lift our nation to you. It needs help. As your reverend people, we pray. We ask for mercy. We need mercy. We ask for mercy. You are a merciful God. Without your mercy, Lord, we're in big trouble in this country. Lord, we pray for the church. And specifically, we pray for the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church. There's no real unity there, Lord. The word united isn't working too well right now. We pray for your blessing and everybody that's involved in this church. And ask for your hand. Even if this church goes through this split, 
that your hand would be with each and things would work for the good. Because we do love you. And we are called to your purposes. And Father, we pray for ourselves. We're bold to do that. Lord, help us to live our faith. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us and said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us. God bless you until we meet again.